Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I've been busy making some modifications to the lab and I've also been busy working on the HW101 project, including finishing the cleaning and getting into the repairs. Let's check it out. All right, it's time to clean the 21 vacuum tubes in this rig. Now, ordinarily, I just clean these guys very carefully with a cotton swab to avoid smudging any of the printing because some of the inks used back then are easy to accidentally remove. But these are so solidly covered in smoke residue that a complete washing is the only solution. They're going to run hot and any tar left on them will just roast and stink up the lab. So I sprayed them down with the diluted cleaning solution, then sprayed them again with water to rinse off the dissolved gunk. I avoided touching the markings while they were still wet, thinking that would at least help preserve most of the ink, and for the most part that worked just fine. The big 6146 finals in particular cleaned up nicely and did not lose any of their markings. And just look at how much crisper that classic GE logo is now. Here's the rest, all sparkly clean and ready to reinstall. I got lucky with my process, it seems the Sylvania and Zenith brand tubes held up well, and it was only a few of the GE ones that lost their identifications. No worries, I just used a sharpie to remark them with their tube number for future identification. The control knobs were a special level of grossness, the smoke accumulation on them was just nauseating. Once again the super clean mixture went to work on it right away, and after a bit of light scrubbing with a flux brush and a water rinse they perked right up. Even the original shine on the plastic and metal bits was still there. Next up for cleaning is the cable that connects the HP23 power supply to the rig. Yep, the cable. Even the stupid cable was not immune to the smoke residue. Fortunately, once again, the same cleaning technique was able to remove most of it, but unfortunately the jacket ended up with some permanent stains. I tried a bit of IPA and it did nothing. I even tried lacquer thinner in a small area and it did something alright. It started to soften the jacket, so I backed off on that idea and quit while I was ahead. Once it dried, I did a quick continuity check to confirm each circuit was still connected and not shorted to any neighboring contacts. It checked out just fine, no issues. Look at this poor little meter. It really needs some love. It was so bad you almost couldn't see the needle and the scale through the bezel. But fortunately the gunk was confined just to the outside surfaces. All the internals stayed clean. So you should know my drill by now. Spray, brush, and rinse, and just like magic all that nasty crap floats away. Now I can actually see through it. What a concept. Here it is put back together. Doesn't it look great? Heck it almost looks brand new. Now I did use a cotton pad to clean the body. I was not going to spray the whole thing down and risk getting the internals all wet. Back to the chassis. The tube sockets need some attention too. In this case it's all about oxidation removal. I'm not a fan of just spraying things with contact cleaner or deoxid. That just creates a big mess. What I do instead is use these tiny sponge sticks soaked in deoxid to apply it individually to each contact. So at this point in the project I pretty much turned the corner from cleaning to repairs and restorations. And it goes without saying this is a monumental cleaning task. Even all the hardware, the nuts, the screws, the washers, just about every surface on the outside of the unit and inside the chassis had some of that tar on it. And a question that's come up in the comments on this project is, does the rig still stink of smoke? And so far I can say the answer is no, it does not. However, there was a slight odor of smoke on the chassis and, of all things, on this cable assembly after they dried from the cleaning. And what I did is use a remedy that's recommended pretty commonly on the internet, use a diluted vinegar mixture. In this case, one part vinegar to four parts water. Sprayed that on the chassis, let it uh, sit there for about five or ten minutes before I rinse it off. And in the case of the cable, just soak the jacket in it for about 15 minutes or so, rinse it off, and it seems to be fine. However, if I take the cable and stuff it up against my nose, I can still smell a slight odor, but uh, clearly not planning on doing that once I get the rig all set up. There is one more test, of course. Once I get it uh, repaired and power it up and it warms up and uh, gets to its operating temperature, is it going to smell then? So that I'll have to find out after I finish all the repairs. First item on the repair list was to replace the five electrolytic and two paper capacitors. That process went easily, so I didn't bother to film it. There's also seven of these 0.2 microfarad caps on the rig. 
per the Heath Kit assembly manual, they're listed as Mylar caps, which is DuPont's trademark for polyester. These typically hold up well over the years, so I was suspecting that they might still be fine. And as it turns out, they are. I desoldered a single lead on two of them and checked them on my Mr. Carlson's leakage tester, and surprise, surprise, they had leakage times equivalent to brand new polyester film units. So I decided to leave them alone. Regarding the resistors, I checked all of them and found 24 that were greater than 10% out. And most of those 24 were high by a lot more than that. The 47Ks here on the audio board were particularly bad, maybe because they saw a lot of heat from the audio tubes. Here's a little trick that I use to find the right solder joints for a targeted resistor. Shine a flashlight on the component side, then look for the shadow of the resistor on the foil side. There's no ground plane on these boards, so the light goes right through them. Access was generally easy, but a couple of them are real bears. And this one here, R401, it connects the grid of the second transmit mixer to the grid of the transmit driver. Its nominal value is 150K, and it measures high at 192K. But I just could not see a way to access it for desoldering without having to first tear out the driver grid and driver plate switchboards, so I decided to leave it be. I'll revisit it later if I have trouble getting the rig to transmit well. With the R's and C's work done, next up is addressing the front panel. If you recall, I had bad results with trying to clean it. I ended up removing most of the paint. So I ordered this replacement applique on eBay from Kevin Mahoney. It's already die cut to the shape needed, including all the necessary holes, which are a bit oversized to make alignment not so critical. It's also got a decent thickness to it, so it should hold up well. I also got a replacement dial window because the original was permanently yellowed. But I made a mistake and ordered the wrong replacement dial. This one's apparently for the HW100, and it has completely different gradations. Oh well, I'll just keep the original. I wiped down the panel with IPA and let it dry before sticking on the applique. Like any sticker, you gotta peel off the release liner. I aligned it in the middle first and then spread it left and right to the edges. Pretty simple. And problem solved. This rig now has excellent graphics again. After that I can reattach the front panel and all of the switches and knobs and rebuild the belt drives for the plate and grid controls. The double capacitor mechanism for the driver pre-selector required a bit of finesse to put back together, but following the assembly manual instructions was a big help. And here it is all put back together. It really looks like a new rig now, doesn't it? I'm very pleased with the quality of Kevin's applique and with just how well everything else cleaned up. I was not very hopeful given the starting conditions. Remember just how bad it was? I'm sure a bit of luck was on my side too. Meaning that level of residue could have easily have done a lot more permanent damage to the plastics and the circuits. But before I take that victory lap, it's now time to carefully power it on and try to bring it back to life and see just how well it can still receive and transmit. So time to break out the dim bulb tester and a few other test instruments and find out. Okay, here I am in the lab and obviously I've cheated a little bit and worked ahead. I've got everything not only connected, but I've got it powered up. So I'll get to the, the results here in a moment. Um, what I wanted to comment on before I get into the actual power-up results is a section of sanity checks that I did on the rig before I connected anything. That section is in the assembly manual on pages 105 to 109 that I have. Uh, it's called preliminary checks, and it's a series of about two dozen or so resistance checks to make between most of the power connection pins on the back and various spots in the circuit. Uh, various interconnections in the in in between some of the boards and so on and essentially it's just looking for the obvious any dead shorts any open circuits and there's also a few resistances to check too just to see uh, if there's any issues or concerns so I did that it took about 20 to 30 minutes and there were no issues so that gave me confidence to move on to the next step so with those preliminary checks done and no issues found, I proceeded to hook up all the hardware you see here. Of course, frequent guest in the lab is the dim bulb tester. I use that all the time when I'm powering up some repaired or newly assembled equipment just to be able to safely apply AC voltage and have an additional element in the series circuit, that light bulb, in case there's a problem with high current being drawn. I did take the time to put the power supply inside the speaker cabinet temporarily just to provide some physical 
uh, protection against me accidentally brushing up against it because the top of that board does have some hazardous high levels of DC voltage on there. So just stick it inside the cabinet for now. Um, I did also, as a safety element, connect up a dummy load to the output. Um, it's better to do that than connect an antenna just in case one or more of the transmit relays or something is malfunctioning and causes it to transmit. So it's immediately going to go into a dummy load and not to an untuned antenna. And then, of course, I need a speaker. Now, ordinarily, this guy right here would be inside the cabinet. Uh, I need to do some repairs to the, it's like a wooden support that the speaker uh, is attached to that basically disintegrated. So I need to remake that in a, in a future video, of course. But for now, I just got it out on the bench and hooked up. So at this point, what I can do is see if we get any audio out of it. Okay, then the next step in the process was to power the unit up through the dim bulb, and I did that and didn't see any issues. The, the bulb was glowing um, moderately bright, which made sense because of the amount of current that the power supply should be drawing. Didn't see any other issues that were alarming, so then I switched it over to take the bulb out, ramp the voltage up, and as you can see, I've gotten up to about 115, uh, maybe 117 uh, my meter's not that accurate, so, so let's just say it's at full line voltage right now and no issues. So the next thing to do is to see if we get any audio out of it, and we do. In this case, that static noise is a good thing because it means that the audio stage is more than likely working okay. It may not be getting any input, but it's trying to output something. Now, the next step here ordinarily would be, well, let's put the rig on the air and see if we get any received signals. There's actually an intermediate step that we can do here on this HW101. There's the crystal calibrator, and the way that Heathkit has designed it, it actually injects the signal right at the front end of the, of the RF chain. So if you can hear the calibrator signal, that's a generally pretty good sign that the entire receive chain is working, and... Listen to that. It's working. So that's a very good sign. Uh, I could play around and go to different spots on the dial, but just the fact that that's working is in fact uh, a, a very good sign that the receive chain seems to be fully functional. It may not be tuned right and it could have other defects with it, but it's definitely trying to receive. Okay, if you're really paying attention, I did something small here. <laughs> Actually, I did something big. I turned the rig on its side. And the reason is, um, as soon as I did that quick swap of the coax cable from the dummy load to my 40 meter antenna, nothing. I could not get any signal coming through. It was just stone quiet. So I was concerned that maybe there's something wrong with the transmit receive relay. So I flipped it over and took a look at it. And I'll show on screen here what I think the issue is. And I noticed this, but didn't pay much attention to it when I was cleaning. But there's something really squirrely connected up to the transmit receive relay by the antenna connection. There's two extra runs of coax that are running off to some RCA jacks. And I think that's just got the circuit interrupted. So what I did, looked at the schematic and found the next point down the circuit and just took a couple jumper wires, which I'm doing here, one for signal, one for ground, to go around that area and try to feed the antenna uh, around that. And lo and behold, hey, yep. and tomorrow morning it's going to be chilly down in the low 60s, and then that wind's uh, going to switch around. <laughs> It's working and working quite well. So I could not be happier at this point. It's a big relief to know that the receive chain is working. There's definitely some calibration issues to deal with, not the least of which is the VFO is way off and the scale is, uh, well, at least the scale's way off, something's way off because um, there's definitely not going to be uh, much um, uh, a single sideband down near that end of, uh, of the band necessarily. So I have to check that out. But the fact that it's uh, working to this point is a very good sign that I'm going to be able to get the rest of the receiver working well. Of course, the HW101 is a transceiver, and I only demonstrated about 50% of its function today. I originally planned on trying out the transmit function and seeing if I can get some power out of it, but that squirrely connection around that TR relay made me a bit nervous. So I'm going to have to dig into that and see what's going on and get that repaired and restored back to original factory shape, and then try out seeing if I can get some power out of this guy. 
That'll be the subject for the next video, along with me doing the alignment and seeing just how well I can get the entire package to work. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you're enjoying the work I've done on this uh, rescue rig. And until next time, bye for now.